Okay. Um, the lesson that I'm going to have you do on your own, I'm having you do because really we've done all of this material. Um, we're looking more at the input and the output of a function, and we did this the first unit, so um, I think you guys will be fine doing this lesson on your own, and then next time we'll pick up with um, a new lesson, okay? When we talk about evaluating a function, what this means is that we are calculating the value of a function's output from a particular input. So when I say evaluate a function, I would have to give you what I want you to evaluate it with what input. So evaluate this function when x is 5. That means we would substitute the 5 in and simplify. So we're basically substituting the input and simplifying to get our output. Okay, we've done that. The next statement says, for example, so this is using function notation. For example, f of 10 equals 4. So we talked last unit in, about this function notation. We should understand at this point that 10 is our input and 4 was our output, but what this means is that we substituted 10 into the function and got 4 out. So in this example, 10 is the input, 4 is the output. This corresponds to the ordered pair 10, 4. Think about x being your input, the y being your output. So let's do some examples actually evaluating a function. It says to evaluate the function at a given input, plug the input value in for the independent variable, in this case, x. So here we go. So we are going to let our function be g of x equals x squared plus 1 over 5 plus x. We are going to evaluate the following expression. So g of 2, this means plug 2 into x. So g of 2 will equal... 2 squared plus 1 over 5 plus 2. Then simplify. So this is 4 plus 1 over 7. G of 2 equals 5 over 7. Corresponding ordered pair, it doesn't ask us to do this, but a corresponding ordered pair then for this function would be 2, 5 over 7. Okay. If you look at the next example, now we're going a little bit more general here. Now we're finding g of a. So instead of plugging in a numeric digit, this means we're plugging a in for x. So same thing that we did in the last one. So instead of x squared, we'll have a squared plus 1 over 5 minus a. Now there's nothing there that we can simplify like we could on the first example. So we would just say that g of a equals a squared plus 1 over 5 plus a. If you look at the next example, now we're doing a couple different things. We're finding g of a, which actually we already have done, and then we're subtracting 2. So our g of a, that was the a squared plus 1 over 5 plus a, and then after that, we're subtracting 2. We could probably simplify this if we made a common denominator. So let's go ahead and do that. So if I put that over 1, common denominator here would be 5 plus a. This term already has it, so I need to multiply top and bottom by 5 plus a. So a squared plus 1 minus 10 minus 2a 
is all over 5 plus a. And then just simplify your numerator a little bit. a squared minus 2a minus 9 over 5 plus a. And at that point, there's I don't think anything more that we can simplify. I want you to notice the difference between this, g of a minus 2, and g of a minus g of 2. Notice in this one, we found g of a, and then from that, we just subtracted 2. The difference here is we're taking our g of a, which again is the a squared plus 1 over 5 plus a, but this time we're subtracting g of 2. We found g of 2 to be 5 over 7, so you really have to watch your notation to make sure that you're doing the correct thing. Uh, same thing on the last example, we can go ahead and make a common denominator. And I did not make a common denominator because there's a 7 here. So I need to multiply this whole first term by 7. Sorry about that. So that would be 7a plus 7. There we go. That looks a little bit better. So again, our common denominator would be the 7 and the 5 plus a factor. So the first term needed that factor of 7. I distributed that on top. The second term needed the 5 plus a factor. So I distributed that. There we go. And then we could do a little bit of simplification here. That would be minus 18, I believe, over 35 plus 7a. All right. I would like you guys to try the first two examples here. So you're given a new function. I want you to evaluate finding h of 3 and h of a. So stop your video now and try the first two. h of 3 should have been 3 squared minus 3 times 3 plus 4, which is 9 minus 9 plus 4, so h of 3 equals 4. For h of a, this should be a squared minus 3a plus 4. If you look at c, now we're doing something a little bit different. We're finding h of a minus 2. That means we're plugging the whole quantity a minus 2 into x. Okay, we're plugging that whole quantity, a minus 2, in for x. So h of a minus 2 will be the quantity a minus 2 squared minus 3 times a minus 2 plus 4. So wherever I had that x, I plugged in the quantity a minus 2. Now, here come your algebra scales, hopefully. We have a little bit of multiplication here. Please do not make an Algebra 1 mistake and say that that is a squared plus 4. You have to remember that when you are multiplying binomials that this is the quantity a minus 2 times the quantity a minus 2. From there you would distribute twice. That turns into a squared minus 4a plus 4 minus 3a plus 6 plus 4 and then simplify anything that you can. So I have a negative 4a and a negative 3a is a negative 7a. And then I have a 4, a 6, and a 4 gives me 14. If you look at what should be d, all you're doing from this example, from the first one, is you're taking what you got for h of a minus 2, which is here, and subtracting 3 from it. So h of a minus 2 minus 3 is taking that a squared minus 7a plus 14 and subtracting 3 off the n. So it's really important that you understand the notation. OK, 
Okay, subtracting 3 on the n versus taking, you know, subtracting g of 2 or whatever it is. Okay. Okay, so we just did a whole slew of examples finding output values, but what if we're going the other way? So what if we're given an input, um, excuse me, given an input, we evaluate the function to find the output. That's what we just did. But sometimes the situation is reversed when we know the output and need to find the corresponding input. So if the function is given by a formula, the input values are solutions to the equation. So if you look at this example, it says consider the function f of x equals 1 over the square root of x minus 4. Part A says to find an x value that results in f of x equals 2. So what they're saying is your value of f of x is 2. So instead of plugging this into the input, we're plugging it into the output because that's what it is. So 2 equals 1 over the square root of x minus 4. Uh, let's see, if I put that over 1, I still need to get rid of that radical. So I'm just going to square everything. So that would be 4 over 1 equals 1 over x minus 4. I needed to get rid of that radical. If I square everything, that does the job. And then I can cross multiply and solve. I really want you to understand what we just did and what we just found. It says find an x value that results in f of x equals 2. So what this is asking us to do is find the input when the output is 2. So I plug 2 in for the output, solved to find the input. So what should happen is if you plug that in for x, you should end up with 2. The next question says, is there an x value that results in f of x equals negative 2? I think the easiest way to explain this is if you look at the graph of this function. So on my graphing calculator, I plugged in that function, the 1 over radical x minus 4, and then I graph it. And if you take a look at this graph, you might notice that we don't have any x values in our function to the left of about 5. And if you look at the table, you see the same thing. You see an x value and a corresponding y value when x is 5, but when you go to smaller numbers for x, you're going to see error. This actually leads into what we're talking about next time with domain and range. Basically what happens here is for this function to be defined, okay, both of these quantities have to be positive. And we're going to, like I said, talk about this more next time. Both of these must be positive. Therefore, f of x is positive for any x value. Okay, think about it. I can't take the square root of something and have it be a negative number. It doesn't make any sense. I can't plug in something to this function and have it come out to be a negative number. Okay, So there is no x value where we would get 2 out as our output. All right, last thing here, finding input and output values from tables and graphs. We've done this a little bit already in our first unit. The first example says the table below shows the daily low temperature for a one-week period. And really, we've done examples almost identical to this. So it's giving you the date in July. It's giving you the low temperature. So if it says find T of 20, 
That means we're finding the temperature when D is 20. So that would be 73 degrees. We're finding T of 19. So that means when D is 19, what's T? Well, that would be 69 degrees. Going the other direction, find T of what equals 73 degrees. So on what date does the temperature equal 73 degrees? So look at your temperatures. We see that, that could be the 17th, and we see that that could be the 20th. Last example, use the graph to evaluate the function at each input or output. Again, we've done um, examples very similar to this before. Okay, So the first example is asking, what is the output when the input is negative 2? Well, if you look at this graph, what's the problem here? If you look at your input, we don't have any negative values. So we would say that this is not defined. Okay, Can't plug in a negative 2. And if you actually read what this graph is talking about, it's talking about um, speed and uh, traveling to and from a store. So we can't have a negative speed is what that comes down to. All right, f of positive 2.5. So at 2.5, what's our output? And that would be 20. f of 4. So when the input is 4, what's the output? So go to 4, up, our output is 10. Now going the other direction, what's the input when the output is zero? So this time I'm looking when my output is zero. So I'm seeing several, several um, times here. Well, when x is zero, y is zero. From about, what, 4.5 to 6? the output is zero. When else? Over here from about 16 to 19. Okay, so there are ranges of when our output is zero. And then, oh, I also see one over here. I almost missed that one. When x is 30, y is zero. Okay. And the last one, what's the input when the output is negative one? So I'm going to um, find negative 1, and this one's kind of hard because you kind of have to guess. So negative 1, I'm going across maybe about right there, so maybe about um, 19, you know. I'm guessing. I'm not exactly sure. And then over here, right before we hit 30, it's probably at negative 1 again, so let's say 29.9 maybe, okay. But as long as we get the idea. So to go along with this lesson, you do have a book assignment, so make sure you take a look at that.